escape into uh, and his torture, how he was captured and tortured, but then his escape into Egypt from uh, the, from Khartoum to Egypt, Turkey, to France, to the United States, New York City, and then to Milton, Massachusetts. Oh. And there's a, I'm reading the book and the Grennans. I said, I know that I know that family. I said, oh. Then I find out that he's also affiliated with InterVarsity. And of course, I've been involved. I know a lot of people. The camp that we use in uh, New Hampshire is an InterVarsity camp. And by the way, the young Chinese girl that was killed in the bombing and uh, in the Marathon bombing. Uh, the pictures you saw of her were at that camp. She was uh, she was affiliated with uh, that camp. She was a nice young Christian gal. Uh, anyway, uh, so this let me read the official bi biographical sketch here. Um, Reverend William Levy is the founder and overseer of Operation Nehemiah Missions International Incorporated since 1993, a U.S.-based Christian ministry dedicated to rebuilding the biblical family and church in the South Sudan from the ashes of war, both spiritually and physically through the preaching of the gospel, promoting sustainability. That's not the UN sustainability, by the way. So <laughs> that's not a bad word in itself, right? Um, and Christian entrepreneurship. Although many secular humanitarian, uh, humanitarian organizations effectively alleviate physical hunger and physical suffering, we understand that man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, Matthew 4.4. 4. Certainly freedom from Islamic tyranny will remove significant challenges to the preaching of the gospel, but we understand that the true oppression is in the heart of man and cannot be alle alleviated by political change. Only Jesus Christ has the power to set men free. Fulfill biblical mandate according to James 1.27 to support the widows and the fatherless. He is a biblical messianic teacher, a visionary, and a gifted communicator of the gospel of Jesus Christ through in church history and uh, uh, thorough in church history and persecution in the Sudan and what the Western church must know to confront the encroachment of Islam on Western culture. His passion is to see that the restoration of the biblical family and church, he speaks to the issues that post-war Judeo-Christian South Sudan and post-Judeo-Christian America have in common. It's kind of interesting how the term post-Judeo-Christian America, and we've seen an example of that just a couple of days ago, didn't we? Yeah. No. That doesn't mean it has to be, but that's where we are today, unfortunately. He, he, resi excuse me, he resides in Lanesboro, Massachusetts with his beloved wife, Hannah, and there's six home-educated children, and he has one of them here. <laughs> His eight brothers and sisters have all repatriated to the South Sudan after 23 years in, um, in uh, Ugandan exile. A pioneering ex exploration in 2004 led them to take up the vision of their late father, I can't pronounce that name, <laughs> Levy, uh, Mr. Levy, once again turning their uh, wilderness home into a thriving community. They broke ground for the first phase of development one year before the CPA was signed, in anticipation of the peace. So let's give him a very warm welcome. Thank you, uh, Brother Shower, uh, Hall, for having this opportunity for us to come in here and, and talk about the issues that face us today in the 21st century, uh, spiritually, physically, economically, in every way. Uh, as we read my uh, text, my background, and my bio, I won't go much into that because it will take us a lot of time, but I'm glad to cover that because I know much, much about it. I'll speak with you about my upbringing in terms of why I'm a Christian and why do I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and what we're doing in South Sudan um, and uh, dealing with the issue of the United Nations and the encroachment in that society and so forth. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you this time. Uh, for this time, I pray that you give me strength and wisdom to try to do everything you want me to do. 
everybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was raised in, um, in Sudan, the largest country in Africa, which was broken into in 2011. I don't know if most of you are familiar with it. Sudan being split. July 9, 2011, Sudan is no longer the largest country in Africa anymore. You have the north, which is controlled by Arab and Islamic, and then you have the south, which is controlled, which is now Africa and Christian. And that's why I was, I was raised. The basis of this country being split into two is this. That is the, that is the Sudan before, uh, after the big This is the south, that's where the star is, that's where we are, we are doing work. The larger part of the country is still in the hands of Arab Islamic forces. There are little bit pockets of uh, states that we still see contest. But now the South Sudan is a free country, as far as Islamic control and oppression goes. But we still have a lot of uh, work to do in that country. Uh, let me give you some history. Uh, I wish you had read my book that Brother Shaw had done, and give some background. Uh, Sudan, being the largest country in Africa, has gone through deep historical roots. Uh, Christianity has flourished in, in the Sudan for over 800 years. 800 years. That means the church started in that country during the first century, prayed of the gospel. You're going back to the book of Acts, that's where the church started. You're going back to the uh, to um, Apostle Philip, the one who converted the Ethiopian eunuch, who brought the gospel back to this region. Now we call uh, Ethiopia. Uh, ancient Ethiopia is in Sudan today. So the church floor is there. The only nation I can remember that has a Christian kingdom at a time was the Nubian Christian kingdom, which is the current the country of Sudan, which is Ethiopia, and the kingdom of the Christian kingdom of Armenia. So you go, it goes back to that. And, uh, and uh, ironically, both nations, both kingdoms came under Islamic attack. We know what the Turks have done to the Armenian Christians, so as, as much as what the Islamic uh, regime have done to the Christians in Nubia, which is my country. So uh, after eight years, they keep on uh, fighting and fighting, and eventually the northern portion of the country succumbs to Islamization, and therefore, most of North Africa, not just our region, but also North of Africa, Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, and Southern Europe, including Spain, uh, Bosnia, part of Yugoslavia today, um, even part of Austria until, uh, until the, the, the King of Poland uh, broke Islam back to Southern Europe. So that's how much Islam has encroached in this region that used to be Judeo-Christian. So this region were one time Christian nation, where the church flourished there for years and years. Now, um, after this Islamization and Islamic takeover came the European colonial power back in uh, 1800s. Here, America has dealt with the Civil War during the time of Abraham Lincoln, and slavery was effectively, effectively stopped in the Western Hemisphere, but slavery continued to flourish in the Nile Valley in the end of Islam. So there was a general from Britain named Charles Gordon, sent by um, the British Prime Minister, uh, and a man named uh, Churchill, who was a young man, served in that army, and, you know, this is all history. So he came in there to stop slave trade in South Sudan. Charles Gordon <coughs> was the general of my country, for over 50 years. So came 1998, 1898, 1898 to 1956. So Sudan was in the hand of British. And then 1956, we got our own independence. 
So we have we end up with this huge country you, you have seen now. But Islam saw their chance. They want to penetrate the interior of the continent of Africa. This is the biggest continent, the second largest in the world in the world. So if that continent succumbed to Islam, definitely even the very existing of American civilization in the Western Hemisphere would be divided. So that's what they wanted. And they want to come by the Western So from 1956 to 1972, we have a civil war. And the purpose of the civil war was that Islam wanted to eradicate the Church of Christ, drive up Christian families into exile, and dominate the entire Nile Valley by the way of Egypt, right down to Lake Victoria and Uganda with Islam. So they didn't care what they said, they wanted to pursue the church. I was born in the middle of the First Civil War. My family were driven to Uganda in exile, where I spent my childhood while my parents were in the wilderness and refused to go to the UN camp because my father would not succumb to the UN agenda at the time, back in late 60s. We opened a wilderness, we thrived. And there was one thing that my parents taught me, is to love God with all my heart, with all my soul. Those of you who read your Bible, those of you who take active responsibility in raising your children, the Bible gives responsibility of raising children to parents, not to government, not to the state, not even to the church, really. They raise the family, they give it to parents. The church benefit from it when the parents are doing their job. So my parents raised me in a in a Christian home, in Judeo Christian home, where I were able to understand the benefit of being a Christian. And it doesn't come without a price. I was told that you may lose your material possession. This land is not ours. We are so joiners in this world. We're passing through to be pursued in holy faith. But if you are being uprooted from here, who do you base your faith on? What are you going to anchor your hope on? If you're not on Christ, everything is a singing ground. Everything is a singing uh, sand. So, 1972, we returned back to South Sudan because the agreement between the North and South was signed in order to unite those can the, the same country that you saw to be one. But Islam is a vicious, it's a vicious uh, ideology. It is a religion that is seeking to dominate politically, uh, religiously, culturally, socially, in every way. They will not rest like homosexuality. They will not rest until they achieve their goal. <coughs> Which way they will, that's what they have to try. So we're back to square one. They don't sign peace to keep. They sign it to buy time so that they can back at the church, at you, at me. So 1982, as a young man, another, we witnessed another war that erupted in my country. That young man of my age, uh, in our 18, 20, <coughs> were to be drafted in the Islamic army and to wage jihad against our own people, the church, no way. So, but as a young man, if you don't know your foundation, you're just there, being moved around, you will succumb to their demand because our country was controlled politically every way in the 80s by Islamic government based in that country. So we in the South had no power. If you had driven the army, you go and fight whoever they want you to fight. So, but I knew the truth because Jesus said, if you know the truth, the truth shall set you free. So, and, and that, as Peter and John were confronted by the Sanhedrin in the book of Acts, not to speak about this name, the name of Jesus Christ. They, he, they say to them, judge for yourself, should we, should we obey men or God? They went on preaching the gospel despite of the fact they could be arrested and killed. So that was the situation I found myself in. Do I follow and obey men or obey God? Muhammad didn't die for me, he didn't die for you, he didn't die for them. But they are fighting for his cause and shedding blood. So I stood against Islam peacefully, not shedding blood, and I was arrested and tortured as a young man for my faith. You know, and uh, most of you are parents, grandparents here. The point is, what are you teaching your children? Will they stand when the persecution comes? But that's what we face in South Sudan. And then as a result of that, I graciously <coughs> read book, this book, you find more of my story and torture in the hand of Islam. But you know, the Bible says, no one single sparrow fall of the sky unless God approves. So God will not allow my life to succumb into the hands of Islam unless he will it. Allow. So in the 
means of that, instead of, instead of taking me through the African nation, he took me through the Islamic world so that I can really deal with Muslims face to face. So I was in Egypt debating Muslims left and right because they wanted to convert. I asked him the reason why they wanted to convert. That's no problem. So if, it's, if it's, uh, it has no foundation, but how will you know? Unless you can sit with them and study the Bible and the Quran at the same time and debate, you know, as you know, them. So that's what I did. So if there was any reason why I went to Egypt, I went to Turkey and came to France, is God say, don't be afraid. Fear not, for I'm with you. So in the in, uh, you know, because at the time I was gripped by fear of what Islam Muslim can do to me. But God said, no, you have the truth. They don't. You got to teach them because you have a solution to what they need to know. So, um, and then when I came to France, I saw a different world. It's a world of sexual immorality. Everywhere was, now we're waking up to homosexuality here. But this Europe is, is thriving on this. It's, it's already there. Europe is tame <coughs> and dominated by homosexual lifestyle. And I find myself in the 80s, I came here in 88, but Europe was already gone in this. And, and you talk of Europe, the church, there. Before America came here, before the Pilgrim came here, you, most of you of the European descent who came here to seek for religious freedom, but Europe brought the ball. That's the problem. And Europe brought the ball for the sake of the UN. And uh, God said, I want you to see this in you. So it's around the world, you saw the European world. Now I'm telling you the United States. So I came to the United States. Between 88 today, America has changed completely. This is not the nation that I knew when I first came here. We came here for religious freedom. We came here because the founding fathers from a nation, you know, where uh, Christ came with proclaim the city on the hill that cannot be hidden. You can quote John Winthrop and quote William Bradford here, right here in the state. Everything began for this nation from this day. It's so unbelievable how Massachusetts has turned out to be today. We are heading the country in the wrong direction. But the Lord brought me to this state. The people I met who laid some groundwork for me to start my life in this country began here. And as uh, I was saying, I met a gentleman from Turkey who started working in their home. And then I am in New Jersey. I was on my way to Washington, D.C. I didn't mean to go there, but I, I got lost. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up in New York, New Jersey. <laughs> in my bio, I didn't tell you one thing, that I have a degree in engineering, uh, in religious and technology. I worked myself out between 88 and 92. Uh, when I graduated from there, I just wanted to live my life here and be free and detach myself from the people and the country I came from. I just wanted to wash my hands and stuff. And God said, no, I'm not done with you. I brought you here for a purpose. I want you to look back to your own country and be a voice for them. So that's really what gave birth to Operation Nehemiah, the ministry that I'm going to address and talk about. Um, so the Lord opened my eyes, provide beyond my own personal needs. And I have, I'm not different from millions of our people. We love two million people, and their only crime is that, that, that they believe in Jesus Christ. So God is saying, do you think you're better than them that they, you, are came, you came to the United States? No. You could have been a statistic on the ground of South Sudan. My father was killed by Islam in 1987. My mother was driven with my siblings into Uganda refugee camp where she died in 1994. The last time I saw my parents alive was 1985. But the foundation they laid for me was unshakable. The foundation to love Jesus Christ and Lord and Savior. I wrote a book called The Bible They Ask. You want to you watch the name. I was at my grandfather's church in 1977. I was uh, a little bit older than my son. And I was going to be baptized, uh, take a personal risk with Christ. My grandfather asked me a question, say, uh, choose for yourself the weapons of your warfare. How are you going to fight the enemy? Who is your enemy? And he gave the Bible and the app, put them there. My hand went on the Bible. I thought I was picking the weaker uh, weapon, but he smiled, and he was glad that he did teach me the right understanding of our spiritual warfare. Ephesians 
That pretty much what sustained me to this day, and I did my spiritual walk. So 1993, uh, South Sudan, nobody hear about the part of people there. We had the tendency to blame people as to who is doing what to help people there. And one day, Richard Wonbrand, a Romanian Jew, a believer, came to our church in a tiny congregation in Jersey, and he challenged me head on. He said, you are here as a young man in Kenya, and God, God brought you here. Why don't you be a spokesperson for your people, for the church? And he challenged the entire church. He said, there's one country where the church still suffers, and the, an American Christian church is doing nothing about it, and that country is the, the place of the country of South Sudan. And I was there in the, in the audience, and I thought he was speaking to me. His word pierced to my heart. Wow. So that's really where I felt like I should draw my ego, my pride, my arrogance, my understanding of what it's like to be in America, is to be a voice of peace. So I studied in school at Christian in Maya. Uh, it's pretty much uh, the definition of a ministry has been defined here. We are not just an internal organization feeding the flesh. We are wanting to spread the gospel to heal Matthew 28 to the great commission. So from 1990, um, 1993 to 2000, we were involved in helping people in Uganda, in South South Sudan, with Peter Hannan. I call it with him. We brought tons of food and medicine into the country. We came from South Africa. We are, we are dealing with the issue from here. And when we're in the field, we unite. And then we help people in Bible and stuff like that. And um, came 2003, we, we couldn't make so much a dent in the refugee camp. South Sudan is still in the state of war. We need to go inside the country and begin to impact the country. We can't give the country to Islam. That's what they want to do. They want to approach you from your country, drive, drive you away, and that's what they like you. That's why most of North Africa has come to Islam, because the citizens of their land, like Egyptian Coptic, they fled the region, and now it's history for them. So because Islam will not let them go back again. Some went to Australia, some came here, and that's what they want. They want to displace the Christian population. And many people say, you are here, why don't you bring your family here? they do, Islam won't, because they want to take the land. Right, I want to be here, mobilize the church in America, and so you can join us in this fight together. So that's my understanding of my being here, is to challenge you to come alongside with us to fight this war. So the war that we're fighting for, not spiritually, I'm not talking about taking a gun and go to a Muslim, because that's <laughs> the purpose, okay? But the spiritual war is real. It's, it's, it's here. Um, so the very freedom that we want to, and that brought us here, is now under attack because Islam has come here, whether you like it or not. If they are here, they have infiltrated the U.S. American Western academic institutions of all levels. And they are rewriting our history books. And three quarters of a politician on both sides of the party are here involved in saying, telling you and I that Islam is the religion of peace. You've got to listen to the, to, to the speeches of our governor right from the stage. So, and, and what I'm saying here could be considered to many of them Islamophobic. That's what they would say. If there's one uh, media people here will say this guy hates Muslims. And that's what it is now <coughs> in America. You can't speak truth. You've got to be politically correct. <laughs> you see? That is the problem. And then where is the First Amendment? <coughs> where is the freedom of speech and religion fit into all of this? we got to speak up. And if Peter and John say we rather obey God, not man, and we speak on this issue, I will speak on this issue. You must speak on this issue. Because the freedom that brought us in this country, as we know it, is gone. But Jesus said, the peace that I give you is not as the world gives you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor be afraid. You are the salt and the light to the nation. 
and shine, not in prosperity when everything is going away, but through access. And so some of you may not understand that the persecution is here. It's very subtle, but it's here. It, it, it's poking you where you stand. And you don't respond to the poking. then you don't know, you don't care. But I know you care, that's why you're here. So, from 2004, we took the ministry to my home village where I grew up. I, I cried when I, I came to uh, the very place where I left in 1985. It's desolate desert, not, not desert. Desolate forest claimed my village. Mm. But that's why we picked up where my current left off. And we said, we've got to take the responsibility and restore this land. We must rebuild the ancient wall. We saw this city dwelling. 2004, that's about 25 years after the war started. The whole village was destroyed. Everybody was driven away. At the time, when you went into South Sudan, the path that I knew growing up as a child was reduced to the road, the highway, reduced the path. Landmines were everywhere. And here I had my wife, an American lady, who has never been to Africa. And uh, we're having our first, she was in the womb, about to be born. And there was standing on my parents' property and was calling me on this satellite phone. <laughs> on and off. That I'm going labor. Uh, I said, Lord, if that's what you want to happen, the child will be born, will be fine. I'll find him born. But the child was born when I came back. Uh, he was but that was 2004. But she was asking me to go to these places, knowing any time she could become a widow, because that's how dangerous it was. But she did not lose hope in what I was doing. In between, the Lord went on him giving us um, five, uh, four more children. There were six of them, all involved in the ministry. In 2005, peace agreement was signed between the North and the South. Not to mention about what happened in 9-11. 9-11 was the wake up for America. At least finally you come in great with the reality of what the devil. We lost 3,000 people and collapsed the U.S. economy. But 3,000 people we lost every day in South Sudan for the past 25 years. So this was constant occurrence for us. But at least we had a presence who understood what was going on. Even those who could not fully understand the depth and the width of the end of Islam, but at least we understood what was going on. Praise and worship. So that's why the war on terrorism began, and that put Northern Islamic government to, the, to their place. They have to deal with the whole reality and set the South Sudan free. So South Sudan got its independence. So from the peace agreement, that brought the country into uh, in a least stable situation, no fighting. To 2011, to referendum, where we have to decide if we want to be part of the North or its place. So I voted here in Arlington, Massachusetts for the South. So July 9, 2011 came, South won 99% for independence. So now we're a new country. The challenge is much different. So what have we been doing in South Sudan since 2004? My progress was this. Rebuild the family. Let the men rise up. Be responsible, fathers and husbands, to restore their family. To do the thing that my parents used to do when they were so young. Family work together. And Stop the UN incursion in the country. And the church leaders should not get themselves involved in programs, which is always here in the West driven by youth culture, women, and men knowing nothing. And that's really what the church has become today. You know, we take our children to public school five days a week to be stranded totally, two parent work to do. And the pastors have grumbled with this fact that they can't even teach truth because people don't want to hear the truth. Mm -hmm. So that culture in America is now filtered abroad. So we say we can't have this. This is not the way the church is going to be strong. You know, women have a specific and important role to play in society. God has created them. The role of motherhood, you know why? You know, it's not a mentality of slavery. God did not create slave out of the woman, but he created partner companion for the man. So the man 
he is not as he is not better than the woman. But God gives each one of us distinct role to play. That's how society is structured. I mean, the, most of you, some of you are older than you here, mothers that we call mother or uh, grandparents. Uh, you know, I have respect for my own mother and for women in general. But there are others, how things are done. I've been with my country. I work with my father and mother. I see others. I love my sisters and my brothers. But men have to do certain things that women can do. Women have to do certain things that men can do. Children have to do certain things that parents can do that design for them. All this is how God created the entire plan for us to dwell as women. If one person try to abdicate the responsibility and go to do other person's role, play that role, you don't have a society. That's what is what is happening to America. But as I was talking to Mr. Charlotte here, since 2000, now we have this millennium problem that the UN have been fixing. They are planning to divide up the family, tear up the fabric of the Judeo Christian family, and promising women in my country a hope that is no longer reflective of their role as to be mother and wife and to support their home. They think children are impediment. Marriage is a man-made thing. Men value control. Women are subservient. And therefore, the woman hopes now realize an education. She needs to have an education. And so we have this epidemic of young women moving throughout the country with no parental oversight, with no, without spiritual oversight, throughout the nation. And now, in South Sudan, we have other warfare in our hand. It's no longer Islamic forces fighting us with the battle of the gun. We have the United Nations. That is so prevalent. They have UN institutions in Duba, causing women for abortion. Girls and young boys can be sexually active, but they don't need to have children. Well, God creates uh, our sexuality in order to procreate. So if you're not ready for it, wait and abstain, right? That's what the church should be teaching. UN telling you the contrary. You do whatever you want. If you get yourself pregnant, fine. Uh, kick the man out of your life, abort the child, go to school, and we will help you. So that is real what is happening in beginning to take root in my country. So we are, but where is the solution? The solution is get to the root of the issue. Because every young man and every young woman there is a son and the daughter. Did you know somebody? Did you know? <laughs> somebody gave the birth to them. Government did not bring a child in this world. The church didn't. The, you know, the UN has no child. They don't. <laughs> so the child belongs to each one, every, every one of us here. All right. So what is the role of the parent? So the, the, the parent has to be held accountable to this. So we are taking one village and one family at a time and trying to help these men, <coughs> young people who have come back from exile who have spent three quarters of their life in a UN refugee camp in Uganda with, in hopelessness. They don't have men to work now anymore. There are no older women teaching the younger ones. There are no older men teaching the younger men to be men, to be women, to be mothers. So this is something that we have to deal with in South Sudan. So when I go there, I don't even go and visit. I stay in the village, and I, we have this continuous teaching of people, men, Please love God, love your wife, Christ, love the church. Train your children in the way they should grow. Work with your own hands. Even the poorest of the poor there has a small piece of land they can cultivate. I said, don't abandon this, this land. Don't go into big cities that you and promise for you so that you go there and become a criminal. And now we have a town, Juba, is swelling with a lot of population. It's like a boom and a bust. Like the, Cal the California gold rush in the 1800s, everybody flocks here in this big city, but there's nothing there. So the police want everything. They want to do the law. They want to make everything. Now they're, they're, the police, the government is reacting: more police, more prison, all of these things. You see, and we are saying the men within our working class don't go to the city to rob this prison. You will need nothing of the U.S. And the pastors equip the same for the workmanship. So in the process of that, we, we start church planting, 
in planning churches there who raise up, God raise up indigenous pastors <coughs> to shepherd their flock. This idea that we have to send permanent missionaries from, from here to shepherd the flock. And then when they pull out and then there was nothing left there, the church is back to square one. And the church remaining mature must be completely restored. So we have to raise up this national people to rise up and disciple their people. So we spend time in raising up men to teach the word of God and to challenge men in the name of to work with their own hands and support their farm. We open up vast agricultural area and training men to work with their own hands so food cannot be brought from Uganda to feed the whole population. It makes no sense. And uh, we talk about um, communication, radio broadcasting. The, the information age has brought blessing by a lot of curses. Who are just the information age? Not the church. Secular media have hijacked the entire system. You know, they, they are coming to your face with this nonsense, whether it is prostitution, pornography, homosexual agenda, and then golf party. So what are we giving back? What, how are we using this information age? Everyone will be in this room. So in South Sudan, we have a Samia Mice trumpet call, a radio station that covers a number of areas. We want them to penetrate the region with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is a baby country. It's just like when the pilgrim came here. It's, it's like a, a blank slate. It needs to be um, built on God, you see? And that's what the Puritan, the pilgrim have done, gave us this country. We're still standing on their soldiers. Without them, we didn't have a country. So you, with your help, this new nation, you can help us so that maybe 100 years from now, we can still stand on the word of God because the opportunities are there. So we started three radio stations and we're building Nehemiah Lighthouse on, on the mountain. He's going to have about a couple minutes to speak about Nehemiah Lighthouse. What is the important role of Nehemiah Lighthouse? But right now we have an FM radio station that covers most of uh, part of South Sudan, part of Northern Uganda with the gospel from 6 to 11 p.m. every day. Bring the gospel. The impact is massive. Drinking has stopped uh, among many people drinking, men are working, women are demanding their role as mothers and, and wives at home, and they, they really are rising up to be star for God. Children are becoming Jesus. When we're there, we're homeschooling. The entire family came around us. Show us how to homeschool. Show mm -hmm. us how to, uh, how do you do this? Because they want to leave it to the experts. People with degrees.